it will forever define the age of disco. When Saturday night meant sex. I got a score tonight, man. I'm horny, you know what I mean? Horny. Drugs. I got double we got. We got, we got some ups, we got some downs, three new ups, two days, and a half a bottle of vodka. And serious line dancing. But prior to its release, the studio did not consider Saturday Night Fever a sure thing. Nobody expected it to do anything. Paramount didn't believe in it. The creative execs thought, well, this is terrible. It's a vulgar little movie. There's all kinds of bad language in here and nudity and rape scenes and God knows what all. To make matters worse, in the fall of 77, there were rumblings of a rebellion against disco. Rumblings the filmmakers were all too aware of as they wrapped production. I put the masters of this album, all four sides, in the back of my car, and it was dawn. I was driving down Hollywood Boulevard, and in front of me, a truck had a bumper sticker saying, Death to Disco. And in the back of my car, I had what was the result of like, nine months' work, and I'm thinking, we're too late. My editor said to me right around the time we finished filming, why are we making a movie about a phenomenon that's dying? I knew you'd piss on it. Go on, just piss on it, right? Presenting the world premiere of Paramount Pictures, Saturday Night Fever, starring John Travolta. When the film debuted on December 7th, 1977, Fever was already surrounded by a frenzy. Paramount arranged for an old-fashioned Hollywood premiere at Mann's Chinese Theater with the biggest stars of the 70s. Tonight, from Hollywood, Peter Frampton, Penny Marshall, John Ritter, Suzanne Summers, John Travolta. There hasn't been a premiere in this town in this scope and this excitement in many, many years. Is it uncomfortable? Is it kind of hard to handle because it, it's bigger than life and everything? It else? is. And, and, and I saw the, the movie for the first time bigger than life. I mean, bigger than it ever had been. So. It was like a fantasy. I mean, it was just like a dream tonight. The audiences were awed as well. Saturday Night Fever topped the box office for weeks and went on to make more than $285 million. It was just so sensational from start to finish, you know, the way it hit uh, society. It's like being strapped on a rocket, you know, and all of a sudden, boom. I mean, it was like hot, you know, everybody wanted to wear the white suit and, and look like us, you know what I mean? Rather than heralding the death of disco, the movie ushered in its heydays. The music and the lifestyle were celebrated at nightclubs like New York's Studio 54. You would see lots of clones of Tony if you went to 54 and those, you know, printed polyester shirts. I remember them very well. Every shop you went had the white suit. And, you know, everybody had the hairstyle and everybody had the chains and all the ladies had the stacked shoes. Dancing, it can't last forever. It's, it's a short-lived kind of thing. In the summer of 1979, disco's fate was sealed by bonfires of vinyl across the country. They started burning disco records. It was a hostility towards it, towards the end. We're talking about these big records, 12-inch records, and, and the paper covers that they came in, so there was something to burn. It was a huge, big, you know, we hate disco. <laughs> It's a film that set trends and captured imaginations. Can I wipe off your forehead? Why not? So go ahead. And its influence is still being felt today. It was pop culture then, and it's pop culture now, because pop culture hasn't changed that much in these years. I love to watch you dance. I, I, I just, just love it, watching you dance. Two decades after its release, Saturday Night Fever is as relevant as ever, and much of the credit goes to John Travolta and the unforgettable character he created. Tony, it's only dancing, Jesus. Only dancing? Forget it, Annette. If you're not gonna take this seriously, I don't wanna dance. The brilliant thing about John Travolta is that he was able to make you like a character who is basically unlikable. Why do you hate me so much? 
I ever did to you was like you. Give me a break, huh? Tony Manero became an icon, a working class hero that legions of young men worshipped. Kiss me. And one of those young men was a budding film critic named Gene Siskel. Gene went to see that movie and it struck a chord deep inside of him and he went back to see it over and over and over again. I'm sure that he saw it uh, more than 20 times. He never got over Saturday Night Fever, Gene Siskel. It was his heartbeat, it was his soul. It, he identified with my character, wished he was the character. I think in a way, Saturday Night Fever was the teenage experience he never had. He would have liked to have had the clothes and the been at the disco, and I think that Tony Manero just represented an alter ego for him. Until his death in 1999, Saturday Night Fever remained Gene Siskel's favorite film. In fact, he was so captivated by it, he bought John Travolta's white suit at a charity auction. He was very proud of it because it represented something tangible to him, not just a souvenir from a movie, but almost like Rosebud, the sled in Citizen Kane, it was almost like the key to something that he missed in his childhood or in his adolescence and always wanted to recapture. More than a film, Saturday Night Fever was a milestone that perfectly captured a moment in time. It's a time capsule. It's an incredibly good representation of a time and a place in the late 1970s in urban America where a lot of disaffected youth are looking for some sense of identity. It's a comment, I think, on that whole era. The way Rebel Without a Cause was in the 50s, I think this film in many ways is, is that to uh, the 70s. And that movie really has held up. You know, it'll be fun in 25 years to look at because its themes are universal. Everybody understands dance. Everybody understands taking your gift and seeing how far it will take you. That film really, really represented what I think every young person wanted. Action!